And thank you everybody for joining us today for this important webinar. On behalf of Corwin, I would like to welcome uh, our presenter today, Ricky Robertson. Ricky is an educational consultant on tra trauma-informed practices and author of Building Resilience in Students Impacted by Adverse Childhood Experiences, published by Corwin. As a teacher and behavior intervention specialist, he has had the privilege to work with students from grades pre-K through 12 who have persevered in the face of adverse experiences and trauma. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Ricky Robertson. Thank you very much. I'd actually like to start today um, introducing the rest of our team. So these are my two co-authors, Victoria Romero and Amber Warner. Victoria is a former teacher and school administrator who now works as a leadership consultant and coach and also a national racial equity consultant in addition to the work that we do in a, around trauma-informed practices. And Amber Warner is a licensed clinical social worker with over 20 years of experience working in schools, hospitals, and private practice with individuals who've experienced trauma. And the three of us work together on authoring our book and providing professional development to schools in trauma-informed practices. I wanna share a little bit about our purpose. So what brought us together to do this work and also what distinguishes our work in the field of trauma-informed practices. So first and foremost, none of us entered into education because we wanted to participate in something that would become branded the school to prison pipeline. We have a recognition that our schools need the resources and the systems in place to adequately address the needs of all of our students and to prevent them from being pushed out. We recognize that ACEs and trauma are an equity issue that even though trauma is prevalent across the socioeconomic spectrum and across race, students of color, LGBTQ students, and students living in generational poverty, and the students who live at the intersection of those identities and experiences are disproportionately impacted by trauma and have less access to resources. Therefore, it was essential to us that our framework address bias and systemic barriers while also emphasizing the importance of culturally responsive teaching and learning. We recognized that we wanted a model that was a whole staff approach and that was multi-tiered. A lot of times trauma-informed work in education can sometimes get reduced and become very much one note where it becomes about um, the teacher-student relationship or classroom-based strategies, and those things are essential. In fact, we call them a relationship-based approach to teaching and learning in our work, but we have to go beyond that. Students have a present varying needs, and schools have to be equipped with the systems and the practices in place to respond to those needs proactively. Otherwise, the school can become just as reactive and chaotic in some ways as the child's home life. So having a multi-tiered approach that extends all the way from the classroom-based strategies to intensive wraparound services is essential to us. We focus on the provider first, recognizing that as educators, we need things that support our resilience so that we can effectively serve our students. And finally, what brought us together in this work is the same thing that has all of us here this afternoon and participating in this webinar, is that we care deeply about our students and our young people, and we wanna make a difference for them. So our model is informed by various bodies of research that we brought together to create our trauma-informed model. We looked at research on high-performing, high-poverty schools, on ACEs and trauma, on Gary Howard's work around culturally responsive teaching and achievement, on social emotional learning competencies, on Carol Dweck's growth mindset and Bonnie Bernard's extensive research on human resilience. And we presented an approach that first focuses on the educator, then on building resilience for our students, and finally on building resilient schools. So we're gonna start focusing on the impact of ACEs and trauma and the foundational research that has given us the understanding we have today to better serve our students. So in 1997, Vincent Felitti and Robert Anda 
um, conducted in partnership with Kaiser Permanente and the Centers for Disease Control, the CDC, conducted the largest ever study on the long-term health impacts of childhood trauma. And they surveyed over 17,000 participants who were patients at different Kaiser Permanente health clinics in Southern California. And they surveyed these patients and they said, these individuals, and they said, you know, of this list of 10 adverse experiences, how many did you experience during childhood? Did you ever experience physical abuse, sexual abuse? Did you have a parent who was incarcerated? And then they took the survey responses and they correlated that with people's health records. In other words, they said, is there any connection between the trauma someone experiences during childhood and their health as an adult? And what they found was remarkable and is transforming our understanding of medicine, of public health, and of education and psychology. First, they found that ACEs and trauma are common. 67% of participants had experienced at least one adverse childhood experience. 20% had experienced sexual abuse. Over a third had experienced physical abuse. 40% of participants had experienced two or more ACEs. Now, there's something about this that's also interesting, is that of the over 17,000 participants in this study, 75% were white. All of the participants had employment and access to healthcare. So in other words, this was a study that was predominantly white, and predominantly middle class, which showed, and further ACEs research has confirmed this, that trauma and ACEs are actually common across the socioeconomic spectrum and across race. So certain populations are particularly vulnerable, especially individuals who are living in poverty, but it's important for us to keep in mind, especially as educators, that we could work in a very well-funded independent private school or we could have students who come from very wealthy homes, and there is very likely that they are also experiencing or have uh, the possibility to experience different types of trauma at home. Perhaps a parent struggling with addiction or mental health issues or different types of abuse that may be taking place. And so we have to recognize how prevalent ACEs and, ACEs and trauma are in our schools and how they impact our students. Second, Felidi and Anda found that ACEs tend to cluster, and this is just kind of common sense. So for another, in other words, if you experience one adverse childhood experience, there's a good probability you'll experience others. And if we think about someone who might have a parent who's an alcoholic, it's also likely that they may witness domestic violence in the home or some type of abuse may also take place, so there could be a separation. So ACEs tend to cluster. And finally, one of the most groundbreaking findings of this study is that ACEs have a dose relationship with long-term health disparities. And that phrase dose relationship is really key. That means that for every adverse childhood experience, so the person becomes significantly more likely to develop a behavioral, psychological, or physical health problem. So for example, in a woman's life, for every adverse childhood experience that, she, that occurs during childhood, she becomes 20% more likely to be hospitalized at some point for an autoimmune disease. Someone who has four ACEs is twice as likely as someone who's had none to develop cancer later in life. Someone with four ACEs is also four and a half times more likely to experience depression, 12 times more likely to attempt suicide. Someone with six ACEs usually has a life expectancy that is typically shortened by approximately 20 years. We also see that a lot of individuals who experience ACEs and trauma early in life by middle childhood and by adolescence have a greater risk for, for engaging in health risk behaviors. So tobacco use or drinking or substance abuse issues or early engagement in sexual activity in order to cope with the social, emotional, and cognitive impairments and suffering that they've experienced from trauma and ACEs. Now, as educators, when we look at this, this list right here on the screen of the original 10 ACEs, and then we think about the students in our classrooms, we know that there are things that are left off of this list. And so current ACEs research is expanding to look at other forms 
of childhood stress and trauma, things like poverty, things like bullying, an understanding that trauma is generational and cumulative. Generational trauma, some of that research actually started because of grandchildren of Holocaust survivors, because pediatric psychiatrists recognized that grandchildren of Holocaust survivors were significantly more likely to suffer from mental health issues and be institutionalized. And so researchers began to uncover when studying different populations who had experienced mass trauma, like war, colonization, genocide, slavery, that trauma actually impacts the genetic information that's passed down from generation to generation. Trauma can also be cumulative. So students and young people who are repeatedly experience different forms of prejudice or discrimination, racism, sexism, homophobia, and the ongoing stress of that. We also have things like homelessness, severe injury, natural disasters, which we've seen quite a bit of lately in the news. And finally, an epidemic in our nation of school shootings. This is just a partial list of school shootings since the beginning of this year. School shootings, we often learn the perpetrator often has a history of ACEs and trauma. Obviously, the event itself is traumatic for everyone involved. And I think that there's a collective trauma that we all experience when we see on the news that kind of gut punch feeling when we um, realize that another school shooting has taken place in this country. So we've talked about research that's looked at this long term health effects of trauma. But fortunately, there's research coming out now that's focusing on the more immediate impact. In other words, how are the students in our classrooms today being impacted by the types of adversity that they're experiencing? Students living with a high number of ACEs are likely to have impaired brain functioning and development, particularly in key areas that are essential for memory, cognition, language, emotional regulation. In other words, the areas of the brain that are essential for success in school are often the most impacted. They struggle with executive functioning, receptive and expressive language. These are our students who have a hard time sometimes with impulse control, or they have a hard time understanding that what they did caused a certain consequence. So it's tough for them to have empathy or to take responsibility for their actions. Uh, oftentimes these students can have a very difficult time with transitions and with emotional regulation. Um, sometimes an exaggerated response to things. So for example, somebody bumps into the student and then they're in a full-blown tantrum or escalation. Or they answer a question wrong in class and now they're so overwhelmed with anxiety and self-criticism that they shut down. This very exaggerated response to a very small situation or stimuli. And finally, by middle childhood in particular, there's a good likelihood that they'll develop different types of externalizing and externalize, internalizing and externalizing behavioral issues. Now, what does that look like in terms of educational outcomes? Well, when we don't provide trauma-informed, multi-tiered supports in our schools, we find that these students are two and a half times more likely to fail a grade. That dose relationship that we talked about with health outcomes, that applies to education as well. In fact, for every adverse childhood experience, a student becomes about 15% more likely to be placed in special education. So by six ACEs, that kid is 100% likelihood of being placed in special ed, which is why what we often see is special education um, gets overtaxed with students. And we're treating different learning disabilities, not recognizing that what we might also be dealing with are symptoms of trauma. And again, we see things in terms of significantly more likely to be chronically absent, to be suspended, expelled, et cetera. So this is our new normal. This is where we find ourselves today as educators. In 2012, we crossed a threshold that we haven't been in since the Great Depression, where now over 50% of children in US public schools live in poverty. And it's not getting better. A third of US children ages 12 to 17 have experienced two or more adverse childhood experiences. And in a lot of areas, that percentage is actually much greater. So consider that along, alongside the huge changes we've seen in parenting particularly research on the impact of cell phones on parenting, the lack of emotional attunement that takes place, particularly during early childhood, 
In other words, in the old days, um, when we weren't as distracted and as plugged in, there were more opportunities for a parent to model and interact with a child and help them understand how to express different emotions in a healthy way. Now researchers find that student, the children often have more negative experiences with their parent. In other words, when they're, when they're acting up, that's when the parent puts down the cell phone and engages with them. So sometimes it's almost like we have students who are immune to negative interactions. In other words, they don't even mind getting in trouble. In fact, it's actually sometimes comforting for them because it means they're going to get engagement and connection. We also have a rising opioid epidemic and increasing poverty rates. And as educators, here we are in the midst of it, vulnerable to compassion fatigue, working in a field where 50% of us are gonna leave within the first five years. And that's not because educators are broken, it's because the system is. And so part of this trauma-informed work has to be about systemic change because we have become, as educators, one of society's first responders. We navigate trauma, we navigate crisis, we navigate conflict each and every day. And first responders, they have specialized training. They have safety check systems. They have processes to debrief. Now, as educators, we get specialized training, but a lot of times it's just about fixing the kid. It's not about creating systems that support us to be effective. Our safety checks are usually like um, an emergency fire drill, but not necessarily how do you do mental health first aid and how do you de-escalate a student in crisis. And when we debrief, we go to the teacher lounge and we process with one another, complain about what just happened, instead of having a process for debriefing that takes into account the needs of the student and the teacher. In other words, I've worked in buildings where educators have, or teachers have been attacked by a student, for example, and sometimes they'll negate the teacher's needs and say, okay, well, what does the student need? Or they'll go to the other extreme and they'll use exclusionary discipline, suspend the student, not provide any additional support for the students, setting them up to fail again in the future. When in fact, what needs to happen is a restorative process that takes into account the needs of everyone involved in that debriefing process, helping people to be heard and to have their needs met. So we need support to foster our resilience for us to be more effective in working with our students. So we're going to talk now about some strategies specifically centered on fostering educator resilience. Yale in 2017-2018 conducted a huge study, over 7,000 participants, teachers from public and private schools. The Center for Emotional Intelligence and New Teacher Center are putting together something called the Emotion Revolution for Teachers because Yale has realized something that I think educators have always known, but folks are finally catching up to us, which is that our mental health impacts our effectiveness. And it also impacts our ability to stay in this field. We lose so many amazing teachers because they're overwhelmed by the demands of the education system and by the, the lack of preparation through trauma-informed practices and through this work to address their needs and adequately serving their students. And so we see things like heightened levels of frustration, of feelings of overwhelm and of stress, particularly among public school teachers. Now those things contribute to something called compassion fatigue, which is after experiencing so much uh, you know, stress and disappointment and vicarious trauma, Oftentimes we see individuals who seem to become cynical or we say that they're self-centered or lazy. I have a lot of compassion for these individuals because I, I personally have been in burnout at different times in my career. Um, and I understand that when you're in that space, it starts to feel like you're in survival mode and like it's my mental health versus my students or versus my colleagues. And we start to pull away and isolate in our field and we can come across as very negative. But compassion, fatigue, and burnout aren't permanent. They don't have to be. And they don't have to be the reason that someone leaves their field. There are things that we can do to help bring ourselves and bring one another back into a space of more positive, productive engagement in our career. Bonnie Bernard has done extensive research on human resilience. And her findings apply to teachers as well as students. And she recognizes certain key factors certain key elements of human resilience. Things like our social competence, our autonomy, having a sense of purpose, so being connected to our why, 
why we are in this field, why we're committed to making a difference with our students, and participating and having a voice in problem solving. When I look at this model, I think about teamwork, to be honest. I think about the incredible importance of having effective leadership teams in schools that provide teachers with a voice for not only what takes place in their classroom, but what takes place throughout the school. And also provides our administrators, because our administrators deal with a tremendous amount of stress and oftentimes carry the weight of the school on their shoulders. And having effective leadership teams and being able to share in problem solving and sharing in a common purpose is incredibly important for our administrators as well. So one of the key things is we have to kind of put our own oxygen mask on first in this work. And that begins with our self-care, but it doesn't end there. So I'm gonna talk for a little bit about self-care and then I'm gonna talk about school-wide systems for educator resilience. So self-care is important because it builds our innate resiliency. And in our book on page 25, we have a template for a self-care plan, and we encourage in the schools that we work with for the staff to create self-care plans that address multiple types of needs, so mental, physical, social, but that not just address you know, the things that we're going to do at home after work, but what are we going to do or what can we do at work to help manage our emotional well-being, for example. Do we need to take some deep breaths? Do we need to make sure that we're hydrated? Do we have a colleague who's a buddy that we can go to and debrief and process after something is really challenging? In fact, it's really essential that teachers buddy up or work together in departments to set goals to support one another's well being so that we're working together and have a sense of connection that honors our health on multiple levels in this work. I'm going to go ahead and play this video for a moment from Jerry Brooks, uh, Social Stories for Teachers. Counselors have social skills books that they can share with kids when they are struggling with certain emotions or certain situations. Here's a good example of one. This is called When My Parents Forgot How to Be Friends. So kids whose parents are arguing, they can read through this and know that people are um, have the same kind of feelings. This one's called uh, But It's Not My Fault for a child who never admits anything that they've done. I've written some social skills books for educators um, that will help them to be able to work through some of the struggles and feelings that they're having. Here's a good one. Um, this is called, um, uh, When You Are Late for Lunch, It Makes Me Want to Punch You. It's going to be great for cafeteria managers. They can read through and, and uh, read about Myrtle, who always wants to punch a teacher when they're late, and how she works through those feelings. Here's another good one. This is called, They Playing Without Me. You see you have a team here, they're kind of bully girls, and they're planning without her. So you can read through this and see how she dealt with that when she was on a team that wouldn't plan with her. Here's a great one for all teachers. It's called, Why You Always Gotta Be Parking In My Spot. It's for those teachers that get frustrated, come in angry all the time because someone's parking in their spots. They can read through this and, and get their feelings out. And here's a real good one everybody will love. The copier's jammed, and I know you did it. That way you can read this when you get frustrated with that teacher that keeps jamming the copier. I hope that you'll get you some social skills group uh, books for teachers. Okay, great. So hopefully you got a laugh out of that. Counselors. There we go. Hopefully you got a laugh out of that. And I share that because um, it might seem silly to go from talking about self-care to then talking about or watching this video about social emotional books for teachers. But there's a researcher, Dr. Brian Sexton out of Duke University, who has identified um, certain things that help to lift our mood kind of immediately. Those, they're those things that help us to enter into a more positive mind frame. And he calls them bite-sized resilience. And there are different bite-sized resiliency exercises that you can incorporate into your classroom or even into your staff meetings. So things like um, writing a brief, uh, you know, journal entry about you at your best when you're feeling like your best self or acknowledging someone for something, or writing a letter of gratitude, or listening to music, or looking at pictures of something that inspires awe, or bringing in something funny and humorous. He has one particular strategy called Three Good Things that is remarkably successful. In fact, it's been shown to be as successful at alleviating the symptoms of depression as Prozac. And that is every day for 14 consecutive days, writing down three good things that happened during your day and your role in them. 
So even if it's something as simple as I saw a beautiful sunset and I was, I stopped to appreciate it, right? And doing that for 14 consecutive days, it's different from a gratitude journal because if we do something every day, it can lose its impact and effectiveness. But just doing this for 14 days has shown to have significant effects on lifting the mood and, and creating a, a more positive outlook. And I think that this can be especially important in our classrooms. Um, I think that there's a, a huge opportunity to, especially with writing, help students construct narratives that are empowering in their concept of themselves. But we'll get to that in a moment when we talk about student resilience. So self-care is key. So we talked about building self-care plans, about buddying up, about working as departments to support common goals around educator self-care. But here's the thing, it can't end there because otherwise self-care just becomes one more thing that a teacher is supposed to do. Like in addition to prepping for all these lessons and doing all of this work, make sure you, know, you get your steps in and you drink plenty of water. It just becomes one more thing. We really have to talk about systems within the building that support educator resilience. So in our professional development, we facilitate conversations among educators, among administrators and teaching staff on what are the systems that they need to put in place in their building in order to feel better, in order to be more supported and effective in the work that they do whether it's around the type of feedback and communication that takes place in the building, or if it's how certain teams are organized in order to accomplish tasks and goals, or if it's the development of something like a tap in tap out program, which is something where a teacher can contact the office and a member of the student support team, like a guidance counselor, or a para perhaps, or an administrator, will come down and give the teacher a break for a couple minutes, particularly after maybe a significant conflict or escalation with a student and it gives that teacher some time to calm down. Or maybe there's been some event in the classroom and the class is still kind of unsettled after maybe there's been an outburst or a tantrum or an escalation. And so they can contact the, team, the support team for tap in, tap out to come in and just be with them in the classroom and assist them in getting the class back on track. Or it could also be the implementation of a ready to learn room, which we'll talk about a little bit later, which is a process where if, if an escalation is so significant that a student has to be sent out of the class, they're gonna receive those additional supports. And the educators also are gonna get some time to process and calm down. So we've talked about self-care buddies and teams, talked about school-based systems, such as tap out and tap out, ready to learn room, and other types of systems we can create with your school the importance of teamwork and maintaining trust. And a lot of this work is also about knowing ourselves, knowing our own history of ACEs and trauma, knowing our triggers and knowing our biases. I had, a, I had an upbringing where I experienced different types of adverse experiences and I definitely saw an impact that would happen in my work when they would get triggered. There, there were times where my self-care personally was a lot more than just making sure I went to the gym after work. It was about making sure that I got counseling. It was about making sure that I tapped into supports and support groups in my community because there were things I had to work through to become a more effective educator. And it's also about a growing awareness of our biases, but all of this in a way that we cultivate and nurture our self-compassion and a growth mindset understanding that wherever we're at in our journey, even if we're deep in burnout, we can be gentle and kind with ourselves and things can get better little by little and we can grow. Next, we're gonna talk about strategies for student resilience. So I'm gonna tell a little bit of a, a story first. So I'm gonna talk about two students. One is a fifth grade girl, um, we'll call her Jenny. So Jenny, was um, someone who I'll never forget. When she had an escalation, everyone in that entire wing of the building would know. So she would flip her desk, she would throw her shoes across the room. One time she ran out of the classroom, went into the middle of the hallway and pulled down her pants and urinated on the floor. Jenny had incredible aggressive escalations that disrupted learning for her entire class and like I said, anyone near that class. Now Jenny was in fifth grade. There was a fourth grade student at this school We'll call her Sarah. And Sarah was kind of the perfect student. She had different jobs in her classroom. She loved to water the plants. She was a very conscientious student, always very helpful. She did really well in her assignments. And Jenny was kind of, would have kind of almost been like a teacher's pet 
there was only one thing about Jenny that she did that, that kind of stood out and kind of troubled her teacher a little bit. And that was that anytime Jenny got a test back, she would go and ask to use the bathroom. But sometimes she wouldn't come back for 10 minutes, maybe even 15 minutes at a time. So I was working in that building and one day we got a call in the office and Jenny's or Sarah's teacher, the fourth grade student said, Sarah has gone to the bathroom and she hasn't come back and it's been almost 20 minutes. So the, some female staff members went to go look in the restrooms and I walked around the campus and I found Sarah behind a portable and she was crouched down and she was pulling her hair and punching herself in the head saying stupid, stupid. And we learned that every time she got a test back and she didn't get a perfect score, she would ask to go to the bathroom and she would actually go hide and self-harm. Now I share this story because Jenny and Sarah were sisters. And from birth to age four and five, they were raised by their parents who were struggling with heroin addiction. And for hours, sometimes days at a time, the two girls would be locked in a bedroom typically with leftover pizza, and they would defecate and urinate in the corner of the room. So both of these girls had experienced significant trauma in early childhood, but had very different symptoms or responses later on in their lives. One being uh, an aggressive and externalizer, and the other being very much a people pleaser, a perfectionist. Now, that's important for us to keep in mind because the way that ACEs and trauma manifest can look very different. And a lot of our interventions primarily focus on those students who are trying to control their external environment by being argumentative or defiant or manipulative or controlling. But oftentimes we forget about the students who are our internalizers, who might struggle with depression or anxiety, or who might be very perfectionistic and oftentimes fly under the radar, but they continue to suffer in silence. And so it's essential, that it, because a lot of our behavioral intervention programs in particular don't address the needs of these students as adequately. I want us to talk a little bit more, more about why we see this spectrum of behaviors. So here we're looking at two brain scans of children. On the healthy brain scan, it's a child who hasn't experienced any adverse childhood experiences or trauma. And then what's labeled as the abused brain is a brain scan of a child who is institutionalized in an orphanage in Romania. Now, if we notice in the healthy brain, quote unquote, we see a decent amount of, of activation of brain functioning throughout the different regions of the brain. Now, when we look at the other brain of the child who's experienced trauma, we notice that we see a lot less activation in the cortex, the prefrontal cortex, and we see little to no activation in those temporal lobes. Now, the thing is, this region of the brain, this cortex, the temporal lobes, this is the part of the brain that helps with things like knowing how to identify and respond and regulate our emotions, um, being able to problem solve, to think about consequences, to process language. This is all essential for our success in school. And what we tend to see for children impacted by ACEs and trauma is an overstimulation of the amygdala and the limbic system which is the fear center of the brain. So these students are in a state of hyper arousal, a heightened and persistent state of fight, flight, or freeze, which makes learning and behaving in a, in a school appropriate manner really challenging. In fact, they don't even necessarily have access oftentimes to the parts of their brain that are gonna help them to make appropriate decisions to be successful in a classroom, which is one of the reasons why classroom-based trauma-informed supports are so essential. Now, research has gone on to look not only at brain development, but even our genetic information, realizing that trauma impacts how our genes are expressed and read and can cause us to have a, a genetic predisposition to an overactive stress response, which over time floods our bodies with stress hormones and later in life can cause chronic illnesses and inflammation. We also see changes in the size and density of the brain, hormones that shrink the hippocampus, that shrink the areas of the brain that help with memory, with recall, with emotional regulation, hyperstimulation, as I said, in the limbic system. Our telomeres um, are the parts of our genetic material, and this is kind of interesting, they're the, they're the end caps of our chromosomes. So almost like that little aglet, that little plastic piece on the end of your shoelaces. So those telomeres help keep our DNA from aging. In kids who've experienced ACEs and trauma, their telomeres actually wear away and are thinner 
meaning that they're actually, their genes are actually aging at a faster pace, which sets them up later in life for different types of physical um, illnesses. We're gonna watch a video for a moment by Dr. Dan Siegel. He's a psychiatrist at the University of UCLA, and he's gonna kind of tie in what I just talked about in terms of the impact of trauma on the brain with strategies that we can use in our classroom. One of the most rewarding experiences for me has been to study brain science and apply it to the experience of parenting. And the hand model of the brain that I use to teach parents is very useful to understand that. So if you take your thumb and put it in the middle of your palm, put your fingers over the top, this is a very useful model of the brain. And when we can actually see in front of us what's going on in the brain, then we can change what the brain does. So let me walk you through very basically what happens in this brain and the structures in it. And it goes like this. The spinal cord comes up, representing the wrist, and then you have coming up into the skull, the brain stem and the limbic area, which work together to help regulate arousal and your emotions and the way you have a fight, flight, freeze response. These are below the cortex, the limbic and brain stem areas, and the cortex is this higher part of the brain that allows us to perceive the outside world, to think and reason. And this frontmost part of the brain, right behind your forehead, so the person's oriented like this, is actually the part that regulates the subcortical limbic and brainstem areas. This regulation is very important because sometimes we can have all sorts of things happen in our life. We're tired, we're exhausted, someone pushes a particular emotional button, and we can flip our lids. So rather than being tuned in and connected and balanced and flexible, we can lose all of that flexibility, even lose moral reasoning and act in ways that are terrifying to others, including our children. Now, you can actually bring yourself back online and come back to the high road and make a repair with your child, and that's important to explain to them. And you can also use this hand model of the brain to explain to children, even as young as five and six, how to understand when their emotions are rising up from the brainstem and limbic areas here and how it's overriding the prefrontal area and making it so they may be about to flip their lids. So I've had kids come tell me that they're about to go flip their lids and they need a break. They need a timeout. And by even just naming that, they can tame it. And that's the power of using the hand model for ourselves and our children to help us all make sense of what goes on in the emotional communication that we have in the course of day-to-day -day life. One now, one of the great things about Dr. Siegel's hand model of the brain is you can now Google and on YouTube, there are videos for K through 12. So there is even like a hand puppet version of the um, hand model of the brain that can explain to kids, like he says, as young as five, a way to show when they're emotionally dysregulated, when they flipped and they need to take a break. I've worked with schools where we've shown that video school-wide to different classrooms, and then teachers have reinforced that in their classroom, encouraging students to go take a break in a classroom cool down corner or mindfulness nook for a couple minutes when they're feeling really afraid or angry or sad. And it helps students not just have an ability to identify their emotions, but to be able to communicate them and then feel them in a healthy way. So there's some key concepts and takeaways at this point. One of them is that when we talk about behavioral issues with our students, we now know that what we're really talking about are issues with brain development and emotional regulation because that's one of the key areas of the brain that's impacted by ACEs and trauma. We also know that we can't problem solve with students or with adults for that matter when we're flipped. We have to bring back that prefrontal cortex and re-engage it. One of the quickest ways to do that is through deep breathing, but also coloring, doing some art, stretching. There's a lot of different strategies that can help us to calm and re-engage that prefrontal cortex. So our work becomes helping students first to calm down and then engage them in the problem solving and reflection process. So this really fundamentally changes our approach to discipline. Discipline used to be associated with punishment, but from a trauma-informed perspective, we understand that discipline is actually a teaching and learning process. 
we have the opportunity to help students gain emotional intelligence, accept responsibility in when they've caused harm, repair harm, acquire a sense of interdependence, to, and, and develop hopefully healthy ways to express their needs and have them met. So discipline becomes a process of teaching and no longer one of punishment and exclusion. And finally, we know that we're most effective when we, look at, when we look at behavior as a form of communication. When a child in our classroom has experienced ACEs or trauma and they're acting out, they're telling us that they need something. And they fundamentally need a sense of safety, belonging, and feeling valued within the context of a healthy, protective relationship. I want to unpack this because this is really important. When I'm talking about safety, I'm talking about physical safety, emotional safety, and intellectual safety. And when I'm talking about feeling valued, I'm meaning that that student's voice and identity is reflected and appreciated in the classroom. So from a culturally responsive perspective, and also from a perspective where the student has a say, they have some opportunities to help in the classroom, to have a classroom job, to participate in some decision making in the classroom and share um, responsibility when appropriate in the classroom, maybe even in older grades, et cetera, to even have opportunities to co-teach um, when they get to that point and they have that knowledge base, but it just allows them to feel valued and that they have a voice in the classroom, similar to the autonomy we talked about for staff in working together on teams. And within the context of healthy, protective relationships. Now, I don't just say that because it sounds good. Harvard University's Center on the Developing Child wanted to find out what is it that makes, what's the difference between toxic stress that becomes debilitating for a child and, and stress that becomes tolerable. In other words, the child might face a lot of stressors. They might grow up in a neighborhood that has a lot of crime or they might grow up in poverty, but somehow they overcome it. And one of the most important protective factors was the presence of a protective, healthy relationship with an adult. There's even been research on high school students in areas that are heavily impacted by opioid addiction, and students with a positive relationship with a teacher are significantly less likely to use heroin. I want that to, sink, to really sink in because we are doing life-changing and life-saving work when we take an, a relationship-based approach to teaching. Now, unfortunately, here's the reality. The kids who need healthy and protective relationships the most often have the least amount of skills to build and maintain them. They grow up in families where relationships may be fragmented or attachment may be chaotic, or there might be different types of abuse where the people they love and trust the most are also the ones who hurt them. So we, we model and kind of divide up a series of strategies. This is on page 89 and 90 in our book. We list over 40 strategies in talk, trust, feel, and repair. So these are strategies to assist in developing healthy communication, things like two by 10, having a two minute conversation about something non-academic for 10 consecutive school days with a student. It helps to build that initial bond and connection and also causes an improvement in behavior and learning having conversations at eye level, having class meetings and class circles, greeting students at the door to the classroom with a handshake or some way of welcoming them in in the day, building trust. John Hattie speaks about the importance of relational and trust and the effect size it has on student learning, building trust through a growth mindset that makes mistakes into opportunities for learning, having high expectations and very consistent and clear routines. And one of the most important areas is having strategies to cultivate healthy emotional regulation. Now, emotional regulation is not manipulation. In other words, it's not telling a child to think more positive or to be happy all the time. It's actually just helping a child to understand what they're feeling and what are some healthy ways that they can express and manage those feelings that don't harm themselves or anyone else. So having a classroom cool down spot or a mindfulness nook, um, having, a, if you're a secondary teacher, you may have a corner of your classroom where a student can go read or take a break, but you might also just have a frank conversation with your students about strategies to manage challenging emotions. Things like taking body breaks, having a school-wide social emotional learning curriculum is key. Mindfulness. And when I say a social emotional curriculum that's school-wide, I don't just mean something that's taught once a week or once every other week or once a month by a guidance counselor. School-wide social-emotional curriculum is reinforced every day. So it's a school-wide language and strategies to help emotional health. And finally, 
having restorative practices in place. I'm also a facilitator in restorative justice or restorative practices. And so I help schools to implement restorative practices so that kids have and students have a way of repairing relationships when harm has been done. Here's an example, a couple photos I'd like to share with you. This is a classroom school down, a classroom cool down spot that a teacher developed. She really loved Star Wars. It's just a corner of her fifth grade classroom where students can go and take a three to five minute break when they're escalated, when they're flipped, and they can use a fidget or they can take deep breaths or they can just use some of their calming strategies, stretching, et cetera, and then re-engage in the class when they're ready. The next photo is of a strategy called a ready to learn room. This was created by a school that all they had was a storage room and very little resources. But this room was used because um, this, student, this school was struggling with a lot of escalations that were causing a lot of kids to be removed from the classroom throughout the course of the day. In fact, when I started working with them, there would be anywhere from 17 to 25 escalations a day that would result in students having to be removed from the classroom. So that can cause a school to fall into chaos. So one of the strategies we implemented was a ready to learn room, which was a place where the students could go and engage in a three-step process. First, selecting something from a menu of a way to find their calm and relax. Then processing the incident by talking about it, using some restorative questioning, and finally identifying what they need to be ready to learn and successfully re-engage in the classroom. Now we implemented multiple multi-tiered trauma-informed strategies and practices. But this brought down the number of students removed from the classroom per day from 17 to 25 down to zero to four by November of that school year, so within about three months. Now the other key part, of course, is sustaining this throughout the year so that these practices continue to stay strong, but they're incredibly effective. And this helps to keep that relationship intact between the teacher and the student, because oftentimes when a student is taken out of a classroom, it can significantly fracture that teacher-student relationship. So strategies for student resilience. We've talked about our Talk, Trust, Feel Repair Toolkit. That's again the over 40 strategies listed on page 89 and 90. We've talked about the importance of multi-tiered restorative practices, things like classroom circles to build community, but also restorative conferences and conversations to repair relationships when a harm has been done. Having something like a ready to learn room or at the secondary level, I've worked with high schools and middle schools where we've converted their in-school suspension room to be a space for restorative practices to take place a school-wide SEL curriculum. Now, oftentimes at the secondary level, they have to be a little bit more creative. So we might look at creating an advisory program or just looking for meaningful ways to embed social emotional curriculum within class content. And finally, developing staff capacity for their understanding of ACEs and trauma, a relationship-based approach to teaching and understanding behavior as a form of communication. So finally, we're going to close today talking briefly about building school resilience. Now, here's our multi-tiered framework. In tier one, we've touched on some of the strategies today. We could only be very brief given the time. We couldn't really go in depth. This is, this is typically a three to four day professional development process. And we didn't get to touch on communication with families or building partnerships with communities or any of our tier two or tier three interventions, things like mentoring programs, things like small group classes and specialized instruction for behavior and social emotional supports, or our tier three, which really focuses on wraparound services, trauma-informed student intervention plans. We often encourage representatives from mental health and social service agencies to join in on the professional development trainings we do with schools in order to strengthen those relationships and improve the services provided and the communication. But what we get a sense of here is a multi-tiered approach. Now when working with schools, it can be tough because sometimes we can become overwhelmed or overzealous. So some schools will say, oh, well, we have two or three classrooms that do cool down spots, so we do that. Well, no, it's not, if it's not throughout the building, then it's not a system. So we really have to focus on, on building those systems and not getting overwhelmed and shutting down, but also not taking on too much and getting overzealous and not being able to sustain it. So it's about working with the school to identify what are our needs and then what are the interventions that are going to leverage the greatest impact that we can implement, monitor, and improve sustainably throughout the course of this year, and then build on that in the future.
So having that three-tiered approach, allowing us to meet and work with students at any level of need or trauma that they're experiencing is vital. In building our school resilience, we focus on having systems in place that are driven and maintained and implemented by teams. This work can never fall on the shoulders of just one or two individuals. We recognize that it has to be multi-tiered and also whole staff. I worked in buildings where the transportation and the custodians have had some of the strongest relationships with students and have some of the most powerful impact impact on the lives of the young people that they work with. So we bring them into this work at every, every educator and school professional has the opportunity to make a tremendous difference. We recognize this as a growth process that's guided by ongoing professional development. If you're a parent or an educator listening to this, part of your work and your takeaway from this might be advocating at your school or district level that you receive, that they receive training on trauma-informed practices for all staff. And finally, this is the most important thing when we engage in this work of building school resilience. We have to trust in our innate capacity to overcome. I talked about telomeres and I showed you those images of the brain. I want to close with two things. One, there was a study done where they, they scanned the brains of children in Romanian orphanages after they were placed in loving foster homes. And they found, I think it was as early as three months, neural development in the cortex and prefrontal cortex. In other words, we have neuroplasticity. We have a brain that is waiting to respond to protective factors and nurture our resilience. And when we engage in talk, trust, feel, repair behaviors with our students, we're actually helping them to practice new behaviors, develop new neural pathways, and heal. And the other thing is, I talked about telomeres, that little thing at the end of our chromosomes that keeps our DNA from aging too soon and protects it. Well, there's a Nobel Prize uh, researcher, Elizabeth Blackburn, and her colleague, Alyssa Eppel. I believe that's their names. I hope so. And they conducted a study where just after eight weeks of practicing mindfulness and compassion exercises, participants' telomeres started to strengthen and lengthen. In other words, our DNA even responds to resilience. That's a powerful thing to know. And so we have to trust in that. It's about removing our barriers to resilience and allowing ourselves and our students to flourish. So thank you very much. Terrific, I have a couple of questions if you're, we got a little bit of time, are you ready for one? Yes. My first question uh, is focused on administrators. How do you recommend getting administrator buy-in for a program such as tap in, tap out, well, it has to be presented within a larger context. So again, as a multi-tiered approach, that's part of it, that's key. Um, another part of it is that, and when it's presented in that context, remember the purpose of something like Tap In, Tap Out is to foster educator resilience to improve educator effectiveness and help our students. So it's within the larger conversation of what's best for our students right, of what's best for their well-being. Tap in, tap out is one strategy that's part of that. Um, so I think that that's key, is how it's framed and that it's clear that it's part of a larger trauma-informed framework. The other piece is, um, at times, it can be having frank conversations with administrators that I have on behalf of their staff to help the administrators understand the need that's in their building. And also, if there are multiple teachers that uh, are expressing this need, if, if parents are expressing a desire to see more trauma-informed work in their schools, then that also helps. Um, at times, though, our administrators are just so overwhelmed, so it's a matter of working with them and helping them to see ways that things like teamwork and trauma-informed work can benefit them as well and can benefit the overall function of the school. I hope that answers the question. Um, but it's about presenting it in the context of that larger conversation that really centers the needs of the child and presents this as just one strategy that supports that resilience of the whole school. Terrific. Thanks. I have one more question and then we'll turn it over to Charlene. So here's the last question. Can you talk more about wraparound services? How do students receive those types of services? I've heard of them, but don't know too much about them. <laughs> 
That's a good question. So typically, unfortunately, what happens is students who typically need wraparound services oftentimes are identified primarily as kids who are struggling behaviorally or they're referred disproportionately to special education. And so sometimes it can be really delayed um, gap between when a student is showing need in the classroom and when there's actually a meeting for wraparound services. And the wraparound services in typically takes place in schools is often led um, by a school psychologist or by a special education team uh, or a guidance counselor. So our model actually suggests that that process be streamlined and that it not require or rely as heavily on special education services but that we develop, help schools to develop systems for identifying when students need wraparound services. And wraparound services, in case there's a question about what that means, is linking a family to supports within the community. So maybe it's mental health counseling, maybe it's support in having certain basic uh, financial needs or food or shelter needs met um, because the family's experiencing a type of crisis or a type of persistent um, struggle. And so it's about connecting families with resources, but also making sure that there's strong connections between those community-based organizations and the schools so that there's some ongoing communication about whether those services were accessed and how effective they are and ways to incorporate things that maybe a counselor is suggesting into the school day, et cetera. Um, so I think that kind of gives a little bit of an overview of what wraparound services are. A student would access them um, when they've been identified as needing additional support. Um, like I said, typically, uh, unfortunately nowadays, a lot of that often tends to fall on a guidance counselor or special ed, um, and sometimes weeks or months after a student has been recommended by a teacher for needing additional support. So we'd, we work to, to streamline that process and, um, and make it more systemic. Thank you very much. Now I'd like to turn it over to Charlene. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, we will be sending a recording of this webinar along with a copy of Ricky's slides to everyone who registered. You should receive this email later this week. Uh, please make sure that corin.com is safe listed so that you receive the email. If you'd like to learn more information about how to integrate whole school supports into your existing school culture and behavior plan, please check out Ricky's uh, book with co-authors Victoria Romero and Amber Warner on building resilience in students impacted by adverse childhood experiences. This uh, practical book uses a read, reflect, and respond model to help you put the strategies into action in your school or district. As a thank you for attending today's webinar, you can receive 20% off the book with promo code webinars at corin.com. For schools and districts focusing on social emotional learning, student engagement, and supporting students' uh, students well-being, you can invite Ricky and his co-authors to work directly with your team through workshops, custom coaching, and implementation. You can contact your Corwin PD advisor at info at corwin.com to request sample agendas, availability, and pricing. Okay, great. Thank you all so much. And thank you everyone who joined today. All right. Thank you so much, Ricky. And thank you everybody again on behalf of Corwin. Uh, this concludes our webinar on adverse childhood experiences with Ricky Robertson. Please join us next Monday, October 1st, for our webinar with John San Giovanni, Jumpstart Student Reasoning and Number Sense for Grades 3 through 8. You can register for this webinar as well as all of our other webinars in the Corn Monday Afternoon Webinar Series at www.corin.com slash webinars. I'm Charlene Maher, and on behalf of Corin, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. We hope to see you next time for another Corin Monday Afternoon Webinar. Have a good evening, and thank you very much. <laughs>